Wyłączyć się? Mhm. Połączy się. Najlepszy Oczywiście. Bez dźwięku, nie? Bez dźwięku, bez... All right, so our second speaker of the session is Bartosz Noskanski. He will tell us about political and environmental. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, my second talk after pandemic that I'm giving in front of the live audience. And I think actually the first talk at the uh, topology, topology conference. Uh, oh, uh, let's see. All right. So, one more one. One one. One. Okay. All right. Shall I repeat? <laughs> okay. So thanks again. Uh, so uh, the talk I'm going to, to give today is about uh, some applications of uh, mostly combinatorial methods, but they have some connection to topology. And it's a joint project with uh, Zbigniew Dauter and Mariusz Jaskowski. So these two guys are uh, crystallographers, chemists. And they study real, uh, real uh, crystals. Uh, Mr. Jakub Malinowski is a student who actually did a lot of nice implementation of Python for us. And this joint project started by actual accident. So, I mean, not, not physical accident, but I was just uh, called by a friend that these uh, two first gentlemen, they were doing some computations with crystals and they were always getting number one. This is how the project started. And it turned out that they had 100 pages of these computations with these uh, crystals. And eventually we managed to shrink it to half a page of the argument that was approved in general case. And that's how the investigation started. So this background that you might not see very well, I mean, it's deliberate. Uh, it's actually going to be the last slide. I'm going to give it uh, with the right contrast. Okay. And uh, the talk is based on actually three papers. So this is just for reference, uh, two papers on Acrist, and they give uh, somehow a conceptual understanding of what this uh, phenomenon about somehow other characteristic flavored uh, counting of the, of the uh, polytopes is. So uh, let me just phrase it, okay, these two papers, and one which is some kind of overview. And uh, the, the talk is going to have some connections to the previous talk, I don't think it's actually the same, uh, precisely the same homomorphism, but I think one can use this technology to somehow functionally define this kind of idea. Okay, and let me let me start with a proper introduction of crystal. So, what's a crystal? I think this this definition was mentioned yesterday. So, it's it's a material that essentially has a sharp diffraction pattern. It's a very strange definition, not very mathematical, uh, but the point is that somehow we don't have a very uh, precise understanding of what the crystal is really because you see a lot of phenomena with different uh, somehow features and they have a lot of things in common but they are not okay change thanks okay. yeah okay so they, there are a lot of phenomena with similar features but they are not exactly identical so for example classical crystals they, they uh, satisfy certain uh, restrictions on geometry, like in dimension three, you'll never see a symmetry of order five. Uh, but on the other hand, when you have a quasi crystal, which is some kind of projection from higher dimension of a proper crystal, they can admit this five dimensional with this uh, order five symmetry. And they all have this, this feature of this sharp diffraction pattern, which is important. But for this talk, uh, the crystals will be mostly related to the CW uh, complexes. Uh, 
And uh, before I introduce the, the CW, let me introduce the crystallographic group. So a crystallographic group, uh, or in general, the space group, sometimes, some, sometimes people simply call it the Berbach group, it's basically a, a discrete subgroup of isometries of the real, real space, which has a compact fundamental domain. I think this is the most uh, economic definition we can make. Uh, what's important about these groups is that they, uh, they are addressed in the 18th Hilbert problem. And it was a big result to show that for every dimension n of the space, we have a finite number of such groups. Of course, this number is growing very fast. In dimension uh, one, we just have uh, two such groups. In dimension zero, there's just a single group. In dimension uh, two, as we'll see, there's 17 and so forth. Uh, but the, the, the most important feature of these groups is that they have very nice presentation. So uh, they have a unique uh, maximal uh, normal abelian subgroup with n generators. So this is the group of translations, right? You shift things in the space. And then on, uh, on top of this group, you build a certain finite subgroup, which can be embedded in GLNZ. So just, just integral matrices. And then you have the uh, extension, on trivial extension, there could be several of these, uh, which is exactly this crystallographic group. Okay. So the group on the left, we always think of this as translations by some natural vectors translation vectors, they, they form this unit cell, it's kind of a poly, polytope, parallel pipe. And on the right, you have uh, something which some people call the point group, or a, it's not exactly in every context, a point group, but something similar to the point group. So all the local symmetries, finite symmetries that you have. And when you combine these two, you get a proper crystallographic group. So the, the main point is that these symmetries, they transform the real crystal. Right? So we are interested in studying how these uh, crystals work, how they uh, morph, how we can encode them in very economic ways. And uh, this is an example. So in dimension two, uh, here you have a nice group. So we have 17 isomorphous classes of these groups, by the way. And this is an example, which is called the wallpaper group P3, because you have these uh, centers of rotations of order three. Okay, so, so every, as you can see, every tile here, this parallel uh, tile is this, uh, this shape here is transformed by a symmetry of order three. And of course, uh, there are some more restrictions, like in particular in dimension two, we have only orders two, three, four, or six. Okay, the, the biggest group you can get, point group, is of order eight, actually. Okay, in dimension three, things become already quite challenging. So we have 230 isomorphous classes. So these, all these groups, it's quite interesting. They are, they are cataloged in these big uh, crystallographic tables. All the properties are there. Uh, but of course, the, the main problem is that if you deal with a real structure, you want to somehow understand uh, something about the structure, you'd like to maybe do it in a very economic way. So with the least amount of effort, and it's not entirely obvious how to do it. So still in dimension three, we don't have elements of order five that, that can appear only in dimension four. Uh, but the number of, uh, of the uh, groups in higher dimensions that grows very fast, so like more than 4,000 in dimension four, 222,000 dimension five. And it's an open question already for dimension six. And the, the main bottleneck is that we don't have a good understanding of finite subgroups in SL, SLNZ. So th this is the main, the main obstruction somehow to classify these, these crystallographic groups in general. So that means that it's, that means that in particular, it's quite interesting to, to seek some kind of invariance that would be independent of the classification, right? If you know complete classification, basically have a lookup table, you can check all the, all the uh, possibilities efficiently. But if you don't have a lookup table, Maybe something else might be applicable. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk specifically about tessellations. Uh, there are many tessellations which can have exactly the same symmetry group. They might not be even necessarily given by polytopes. That, 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 that's a more flexible notion. However, uh, for the sake of uh, some kind of sanity, I'm assuming that uh, the tessellations I'm going to consider today are simply normal. So normal means that 
they, they are normal in the usual sense so that every tile, so every piece that we copy paste in the space with some kind of symmetry group is, is essentially a topological ball. That's quite a reasonable assumption that it's a connected space, even simply connected. Uh, the intersection of every two tiles is actually connected as well. So that, that excludes a lot of uh, strange uh, situations, which can be somehow addressed in different ways by, for example, adding some barycentric subdivision into the CW complex. So we, we don't need this kind of uh, fancy uh, tessellations that would not satisfy condition two. And the third condition, so the tiles of the tessellations are uniformly bounded. So uh, yesterday, the, uh, the, the revealed medals announced, and one of the results was by uh, Marina Vyazowska, who was studying the uh, kissing numbers and the steer packing in uh, several dimensions. And all these steers were essentially of the same size. And this is the challenging feature, right? If you have objects of the same size, it's difficult to pack them in space. Of course, if you don't have a bound on the size, you can, you can pack it very optimally, right? So, so here we are making, again, the same assumption that all the uh, tiles are actually uniformly bounded. But of course, the, the packing here is completely optimal because we are filling up the space uh, and there are no holes, okay? Of course, the problem is, uh, is much easier than the spear packing uh, because uh, since we don't have holes, we have a complete control on the symmetry. So that's a completely different story. Okay, and uh, we are going to look at these uh, tessellations as CW complexes, or in fact, as inductive limit of growing finite tessellations, okay? So, so what I mean by this is that you can imagine that every tessellation, every crystal, when it's growing, it's just building up from more and more blocks, and you can fill up the space eventually with the, the inductive limit of these blocks. So we are eventually going to have a full uh, Euclidean space fill, but in every step, there is just a finite amount of these CW complexes that we need to somehow understand this, this uh, object. But of course, the, the a complex, a complete object is quite different from the finite uh, subset. So uh, we are going to eventually work with this limit, but in a different way. So by compactifying the space, by switching to a, to a geometry, which is uh, connected to the orbifolds. Okay, so we have this interesting feature that these tessellations, they, they satisfy the symmetry. So somehow wrapping with the symmetry gives you a compact space, which has much better properties than the original object. And this is an example of the growing tessellation. So you first start with the simple vertex, and then you add four, four tiles, and then it grows, expands. In this case, it actually expands homogeneously in dimension x and y. And of course, now you can think of this as this Growing, growing sequence or as the limit. So the limit will be the whole uh, plane. But of course, you can now think of this in a different way. So you can think of this as some kind of tile which has identified uh, edges. And this will be a model of a torus, right? It's an example. It's a simple example of an orbit. OK, and now the goal is uh, it's part of this work is still work in progress. So I'm going to have some questions for you. But the main goal is to actually build some kind of numerical invariance of these tessellations that can characterize, characterize them in, in various ways. And by various ways, I mean topologically, uh, rigidly, so with respect to the symmetry. And we want to find something which is very economical. So of course, if you understand completely the, the shape of the tile, you know what's, what's the group uh, of, of symmetries that is tiling it through the space, then you know essentially everything about the crystal. But now you imagine a situation that you just have a partial amount of information and you would somehow like to encode it in maybe a, a finite number of, of integers that would completely characterize it as some kind of hash signature. So our point of departure was actually uh, this, this observation that every regular tessellation, so crystallographic ones, they have this, this unique weighted Euler characteristic. I'm going to introduce it in a second. And it turns out that this other characteristic is a very nice point of departure to somehow uh, define a more refined invariance of, of tessellations, which I'm going to show in the end, possibly have the feature that they can uniquely identify the tessellation without knowing everything about the tessellation itself. Okay, 
So the other characteristic was introduced in the previous talks. I don't have uh, the need to, to repeat that. Uh, I'm going to mostly use this uh, polytopo version uh, of the other characteristic. Uh, but uh, for the uh, purpose of doing it properly for crystallographic structures or orbitals, it makes sense to add some kind of weights. So instead of just taking adding uh, one or an element which is which is compact uh, and simply connected, we add uh, one over m m i j, which is a certain weight, which will correspond to how the symmetry of this crystal fixes this element in the in the lattice. Okay, and this is the the, the main uh, new feature in this in this definition of chi l. And and now the trick is that. If you, uh, if you want to do it properly, it turns out that there is a very nice gadget coming from differential geometry, which was originally introduced by, by Satake in the 50s, who studied it for the sake of uh, doing some automorphic forms. Then uh, it was called V-manifold, by the way, at that time. And then it was, uh, it was uh, some kind of a, a poll made by Thurston, and, and with his students, they decided to call it orbifolds. And what is this? Uh, what is this gadget? So it's basically a quotient space. So we take the Euclidean space, we divide it by the crystallographic group. Of course, not every group G will leads to a reasonable orbital, but in this case, it will. And and the main point is that it's not only this Hausdorff space, the space of orbits that we care about, but we also care about this this uh, atlas structure, so that we have points which have usual manifold neighborhoods. Rn, but there are also these singular points from the singular set, which have this kind of fractional neighbor, okay, in the sense that they have this, this cuspidal features, they have this, this symmetry embedded. So I usually imagine it in the way that when you play this kind of computer game in which you enter the screen from the left, you leave from the right, then you can sometimes leave it with a certain angle. And that's exactly the kind of feature that we want to cherish. But now the main point of, of using this for crystallography is that there is a very, uh, very simple observation, which turns out to be very fruitful, is that we are making a quotient by a group, which has a finite index subgroup, which is uh, abelian, this is e to power n. So that means that the, uh, the covering of, the, of every orbital, which is coming from crystallography, is essentially a torus, right? It's, it's exactly this orbit holding of the unit cell, yeah, just an n-dimensional torus. And now this is enough to already conclude with this general uh, characteristic of the Euler number for, for every crystallographic group, because we know that the uh, characteristic of the torus is simply zero. So now the only thing we need is some kind of connection between the cover and the zero on the top. And uh, so this will happen in a second. Let me just show you one concrete example is this orbifold P3. So now we are not looking only at this tessellation as, as just tiles, but we think of this as some geometric space where A is really just one vertex, B and C are two distinct vertices, and they have this fractional neighborhood. So if you go like one third of the circle, you actually end up in the same spot. So you go around this one third of the full angle. And of course, the, the insides, so the interior of the style is the proper Euclidean space. And the, of course, you also identify the edges, so alpha with alpha, beta with beta, and then you get this, this quite fancy uh, orbifold space, which of course now is, uh, is not a manifold anymore, but it encodes completely the information about this group and this timing. And that's another example in 3D. So uh, some of these uh, faces, they are mirrors. So when you go in, you go out from the same mirror, just in the opposite direction. And some of them are like these teleports, right? So when you enter in, you go from the other side. And of course, now to, 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 to understand this geometry, you don't need to do the pictures. You just simply need to understand how the group is actually acting on the fundamental domain. OK, so now the point is that we have this very nice notion of the orbital. Uh, characteristic. And uh, the orbifold Euler characteristic is essentially like the usual Euler characteristic, but defined with weights. And to do the, this weight, we actually introduce this, this measure of one over 
uh, order of gamma, where gamma is the stabilizer group of the of the cell sigma. Okay, so that means that in particular, if you want to do it uh, in the right way, you need to uh, introduce a CW structure which is compatible with the group acting on this space. And now you add up things over dimension. So the dimension is is the index for minus one. And now it's a one line proof to, to show that this Euler characteristic actually satisfies a very, very simple fact. It's this key fact on the top. So that if you have an orbifold cover, so a cover of two orbifolds, so two Hausdorff spaces, which respects these compatibilities uh, for the local neighborhoods, the Euler characteristic of the top space is actually D, so the degree of the cover times the Euler characteristic of the bottom. So, so uh, there are ver versions of this, of this theorem which have some kind of correction terms, but the trick is that in this version, we don't have correction terms because everything is encoded in the fact that we have these neighborhoods counted with multiplicities. So th this is really gone. So this Euler characteristic is really fully multiplicative. And now it's a trivial co corollary to show that since we have on the top space, we have the torus, which has Euler characteristic of classical, uh, Euler characteristic uh, equal to zero, then the bottom space, the quotient, the quotient by the full crystallographic group also has Euler characteristic zero, okay? And, and that's a theorem which somehow simplified all these 100 pages of calculations of these two gentlemen that they did by hand. So it was quite impressive for me to actually browse through their document because they never made a mistake, which was quite surprising for 230 groups and standard tessellations. They, always got one and that was exactly uh, why it was one not zero because they were not subtracting the, the cell, the three-dimensional cells. When you subtract it, you get exactly zero. And now the, the upshot is that this theorem actually works in every dimension, okay? So, so this means that of course, all right, so now the other characteristic is not entirely useful to distinguish anything in crystallography because you always get a zero, okay? But it turns out that it has actually has some applications because we uh, we want to look at not only at the Euler characteristic but also at these contributions that we have on the right. It's one over gamma gamma of sigma. So uh, from this we can form a vector uh, about which I'm going to think sometimes about like some kind of uh, vector of Betty numbers, fractional Betty numbers. But there is another way of thinking about this as some kind of uh, leading coefficients of the growth functions. And what are the growth functions in this sense? So imagine that you, uh, you so now we switch perspectives. So we were talking about orbifolds, but now let's, let's think again about the tessellation as something that is growing in space. And, and already Coxeter had this, this very nice idea in the, in the 40s that you can think of, uh, of a function, some kind of function measuring the growth of the tessellation in the following way that you start from the vertex, you choose some kind of a metric, it can be just a regular Euclidean metric with a ball, and you try to count the number of J dimensional cells within uh, this tessellation, which are completely covered or partially covered by the ball of radius R. And, and what he managed to show in, in some number of examples was this uh, quite remarkable fact that th these functions they have some kind of bounded growth. So of course they grow proportionally to the, to the radius with power n, and this limit is always finite. And now when you add these numbers with this telescoping sum, it actually gives you a zero. But he had no clue about orbifolds. This was just 10 years before orbifolds were even introduced. So somehow the proof is completely combinatorial, but now it, it, it somehow shows us that there might be some potential connection between the orbifolds and this orbital weight, so these fractional Betty numbers, and these actual growth functions. And now, what's the point? So the point is that if we uh, take this orbital vector that we had just two slides ago, sorry, one slide ago, this one, it's actually equal to these limiting numbers. So the, the essential size of the growth of the functions up to a constant. And this constant is actually very explicit is basically the size of the point group, this, this P group of the crystallographic group, times a quotient of two volumes. So the volume of the unit ball, dimension F, 
divided by the volume of the unit cell scaled up so that every every vector has as uh, growth one. Okay, so this means for us that there is a non-trivial connection between uh, some properties of this wrapped space of the orbifold and some kind of growth functions. So this 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 finite finite process of growing the tessellation by itself, and it's all, all controlled by by the metric. So these unit ball unit cell volumes and the geometry of the group. And now it turns out that this is not all because these growth functions, they have lower order terms, but of course, depending on the metric, it's difficult to, to reveal them. So we would like to see explicitly how these growth functions look like. And now there is some kind of analogy. So, so uh, I was, I'm, in my training, I'm an algebraic geometer. And whenever I think about this space, I think about the uh, functions on this space. And the, the functions on the space, if you have a scheme, a algebraic variety, they completely characterize the space itself. So you can you can ask here a kind of a bold uh, question: Is it possible that the crystallographic tessellations or tessellations in general they can be somehow characterized by properly chosen growth functions? And if you choose them correctly, they will reveal all the features of the tessellation, or essentially encode all the features of the tessellation in some kind of function, some kind of regular functions. Of course, this, this analogy is very vague because we have completely different objects, but it's good to think about this as some kind of factorial switch. So we switch from the geometry to some kind of combinatorial uh, ring structure that will encode essentially this tessellation. And, and here's what happens. So, so I'm going to, to finish this talk with two attempts. One is uh, already quite successful. The other one is very puzzling. So one possibility to, to make these growth functions a little bit better than in case of, of, uh, of Coxeter is by treating them not in the Euclidean metric with the poles, but rather in the graph metric, right? So the graph metric means that we start from a vertex and we expand, we count the number of I-dimensional cells, which are within a, a walk from this vertex with up to N steps from that point. And this, this, these, these functions we, we call uh, simply topological growth functions for a very simple reason that if you disturb a little bit the topology of the, of the tessellation, you still get exactly the same functions. So it's clear that these functions are not encoding properly all the features of the, of the crystallographic group of, uh, of all the features of the tessellation, but rather some kind of topological features of the tessellation. And now it's not difficult to show that uh, if you have such a definition, then these functions are first of all uh, degree uh, degree i polynomials. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, that's a nonsense. Uh, these are uh, degree n, where the, there should be capital n for the dimension of the space uh, polynomials in variable n, and they all have integer coefficients. So why they have integer coefficients? That's not entirely obvious, but it follows from the fact that we are interpolating an, an integer a, a polynomial of, of a certain degree with values which are integers. So, so that's, that's why, 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 where it comes from. Now, the interesting fact about these functions is that somehow factorialize, strange word, uh, the, the, this, this vector of the fractional Betty numbers of the orbital. So I said fractional Betty numbers, but you can scale it up so that all these numbers become integers. There is a common denominator. And it turns out that with the proper scaling, these are exactly the leading terms of these growth functions. So somehow the growth function has uh, exactly the same information as what orbital has, plus it also contains information about what happens on the boundary of the orbital. And this is the secondary term. And here's an example, very simple one. So if you just take a, a growth polynomials for the P1 tessellation, so you just have uh, no, no extra symmetry except for the translations. Then you can count now uh, for every dimension what is the number of cells. So zero dimensional cells, so vertices. As you can see they grow like there's one vertex, nine vertices, uh, 25 vertices. So this is exactly 2n plus 1 squared. That's exactly the function that you get here. Uh, for f1, uh, well, let's switch first to f2. f2 is the number of faces. 
and that's obviously 2n squared, right? And now you know that these three functions, because the tessellation is growing and it's, it's, a, it's a simply connected tessellation, right? In every finite step, then they satisfy the usual Euler characteristics. So F0 minus F1 plus F2 equals one. Right, so you can compute F F one already from F zero and F two, but of course you can do it directly as well. And now notice that that strange correspondence. So that if you take the leading coefficients one to one, well, these are exactly the Betti numbers or the orbifold weights for the torus. And of course, these numbers are going to be different if you will take higher symmetry. Now, of course, you can say, okay, but if I make this uh, tessellation into something which is filled with with squares, I get, I get already a higher symmetry, but the same polynomials, and you're actually right. But now I'm going to show you that there is another variant of these growth polynomials, which can be sensitive to the change of the geometry. Uh, here's a table of some more examples. So, so if you're interested, we have now a package that for any given tessellation, so you give us some finite amount of data, we can compute these polynomials uh, rather quickly. And uh, what's important is exactly this connection, right? So these numbers, 12, 24, 12, they correspond to these orbifold weights. But of course, the orbifold weights, they have to be normalized. And, and these are the corresponding, the corresponding tessellations. So the first, the first uh, three rows, so P3, P6, P6, M, they correspond to these planar ones. So they are there. And these are the, the three-dimensional examples, some high symmetry, and they lead to these, these two uh, families of polynomials. And as I said, uh, now these topological features can be used. So uh, here's one example. Uh, oh, sorry, just before that. So let me, uh, let me show you the uh, exact formula that is in dimension two. So in dimension two, we have this, this privilege that Every tessellation is essentially done by hexagons. I mean, one of the one of the collections of, of edges can be degenerate, just a point. Then you just have some kind of wobbly uh, quadrangle. But these are essentially two different types that can happen. So you either get a torus in the usual identification, or you get this twisted torus version. And now, if you count now the number of uh, of elements in this. Uh, omega cell that is being translated just by translations, you get exactly these formulas. So these are exactly the polynomials that I showed you before, but now they can be completely theoretically computed. So that means in particular that this num these numbers, they encode explicitly this orbifold input. Okay, and one experimental application uh, is that now if you have some kind of disturbed topological uh, tessellation, you can you can determine its, its, its type by basically locally counting these growth functions. So you don't have to study the, the global geometry of this, of this tessellation, the, this polynomial surface. And then here the experiment goes as follows that if you change the, uh, the, the local disturbance, so you either remove the, the middle point or not, then you change the topology of this tessellation and then you can average and, ch and check effectively uh, the, the kind of local uh, geometry that you're having, but that's still quite weak. So we were trying to find something, something uh, a bit more uh, refined, and it turned out that the better choice for these growth functions would be to actually take this natural uh, parallelogram for the translations, the, the, this green one, and count the number of cells, not like before, so that we start from the vertex and count the number of cells. A, in an n, n step path, but rather that we propagate against this original tessellation, the tessellation with these unit cells, and we count the number of properly uh, included cells within this propagation of the unit cell tessellation. And now you have an extra freedom because if you move this point from that, that step here to somewhere in this region, you're going to get different functions. And then these functions are going to change. So, so now the, the upshot is that with this extra feature, you can encode actually parts of the symmetry. And now this is heavily work in progress. So this will be mostly pictures to show you. 
So every color here represents a, a unique triple of functions, which are different. So if it's green, they are exactly the same. If it's red, they are also the same, but if it's, it's, it's orange, they, they, one of these three functions is actually different. What's critical about the, this making these pictures is that these, uh, these frames, they should be uh, rationally proportional to the, uh, to the uh, natural translation steps in this tessellation. So if you make a, a, a dilation, you, you, you just contract this by a factor of one of, of square root of two or something, then of course these things, these things will lose the periodicity, right? You just have by a Fantine approximation. But here you actually can see that now you have a lot of interesting data going on just because we changed slightly the definition of these growth functions. And uh, I'm leaving it as some kind of challenge, and some, some kind of excuse for discussion. What kind of information can be now extracted from these functions? So we can already see that there are some avatars of this original uh, fourfold symmetry already encoded. Well, I, I suspect uh, that there is some more uh, information here in particular. Uh, we can encode here some kind of representation of these crystallographic groups on finite dimensional spaces. And we are hoping to, to, to see exactly what's, what kind of information is really encoded. Now, the nice thing about these, these, these pictures is that you can make them easily by a trick. So you just sample space with random points and you observe that if you propagate it in both di directions uh, from this point, there is, a, there is always an open, open uh, region which has exactly the shape of this, uh, of this unit cell in which these functions are not going to change. So it's kind of locally constant, but the uh, proportions in which this changes are actually quite tricky and they are related to the denominators of, of the uh, sizes of the vertices and the symmetry and so on. So this one over seven here is actually uh, an interesting uh, denominator that's happening here. We don't have a seven-fold symmetry, but we have this proportion encoded in how this geometry looks like. Okay, so this is one, one example. Here's another example for 6363 6, tessellation. You can see that, again, there is a different feature here because this, this translation uh, cell is actually skewed. And this somehow corresponds exactly to this pattern here. And here's another kind of example for the dual tessellation 884. But again, the same feature, we encode a lot of symmetry here. Uh, one thing which is not maybe entirely visible in these pictures is that uh, also the vertices and the edges of these rectangles, they encode some kind of degenerate version of these polynomials and they have extra, extra information. So we have examples where there's just one color for the, for the whole uh, two dimensional part, but a lot of information is encoded in these uh, in these edges. Okay, yeah. So so what's the plan for the future? So first of all, well, we hope that now with this Python package and with this uh, partial information that we have so far, we'll be able to. Well, the hope is the optimal hope is to, to actually find theoretical explanation exact for these symmetries that we have. But we also are trying to to to. Uh, embrace the possibility that using some kind of machine learning techniques and training it on the set of like 1000 tessellations with known symmetries, we'll be able to extract the amount of data, minimal amount of data that is necessary to see what is really the correlation between these colors and the distribution of these colors and the symmetry that we, we have in this tessellation. And then the, that's an ongoing project. So I hope that maybe in a year, I'll have a nice update about this, but it's, it's still experimental and we are not sure what's going to happen. So that's, that's all I, to, I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Questions for Mark? Can you actually say a little bit about this AI now? Then? It's very unexpected to see this in them. Uh, you mean about this AI part? Yeah, so, so the point is that in, in every of these pictures, uh, these representations are given by finitely many integers, right? So you have just three polynomials. Uh, 
So, so you can now uh, think of this, the, the training set is that we have for every tessellation, we have this tuple of integers and we associate to this tuple of integers, this, this crystallographic group or some information about it, what are the point groups and so on. And, and now the, the, the expectation is that these integers, they satisfy some kind of linear or multiplicative simple constraints that will allow us to reveal exactly what is the correlation between the order of the group and exactly these numbers. And we have so far some examples where this actually works. So you take some kind of difference or you take some kind of quotient, you can estimate this quotient and you can predict that the group is as big as something. And it's kind of miracle, but I mean, we have seen these miracles recently that Jordi Williamson, I think, proved the conjecture about knots using this kind of experimental approach. So we are hoping that maybe uh, we are going to get some kind of result, maybe not as strong as these ones, but something in this flavor. So I expect that maybe at least what we'll be able to say is to distinguish between some uh, sets of groups by using only these color diagrams. And I think this will be already quite cool to, to have this very you know, uh, limited data, which you can just get by Monte Carlo and then see, okay, the portion of these coefficients is big and so and so, so then we get this group. Of course, the, the, the power of this technique grows with dimension. So if you go to dimension four, five, six, you should be able to, 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 to get it more efficiently because in dimension three, so especially this dispersed author is being a doubter when he sees a tessellation, it just takes him a half a second to figure out exactly the symmetry group. So I think in this sense, we already have a trained uh, artificial, not real, uh, real, real for the network, real neural network that works very efficiently, but somehow it's very difficult to extract his knowledge into this kind of setup. So that, that's our goal. Um, any more questions? Anyone wants to try the solution? Oh, I already said that we have, a, we have this package. So if anyone will be interested, I'm happy to share. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Oh, uh, this is a Logitech pointer. It's called a Spotlight. And it, you know, the, the, the thing is that it actually works, uh, you know, it has this kind of gravitometer. So when I move, it actually moves. I mean, here it's a recording. So here it's really like. So it's actually connected to the computer. Uh, it is by Bluetooth. Amazing. And it's um, it's tied to like PowerPoint or it just works? No, no, it works uh, absolutely fine with everything that you want. Actually, it also has this feature, but I was not able to 